Hello and welcome to the Anne and Philip Scoop. As you can see, it's just me today. From from a lot of the scoop, we Anne will be joining us for one of the interviews that we're doing. Um, so we're back from a, a break after my birthday trip to parts unknown. What's on the show today? Why Donald Trump should treat his trial with contempt, and we mean that literally. Um, we are releasing the trailer for our October seventh play, the play about the Hamas massacres in Israel. Uh, we are also casting and rehearsing. We'll give you um, all the details on that. We only question that needs to be asked is when are we going to see you in New York or your family members or your friends? Are you coming to the play? Go to October 7, theplay.com to buy your tickets. And we bring you the truth about the numbers on abortion and Israel. Um, and in a shocking development, I know this is going to be Incredible news, but that's what we do. We bring you incredible news. We discover that the Biden administration and Hamas are not entirely trustworthy, especially about figures. Who would have thought it? So we, we, we bring you the truth behind the dodgy statistics. So play updates. We're now in full play mode. When you're seeing this, we're about to start rehearsals. We, we, we've just released the trailer. Let's play the trailer now. The world wants you to forget what happened in Israel on October 7th. We have covered many shocking stories, but nothing comes close to what the men, women and children of Israel faced that day. We're investigative journalists, Anne McElhenney and Phil McAleer. We travelled to Israel after October the 7th and talked to those who lived through that day. Their stories are tragic, they are moving and they are heroic. They are also very, very compelling. We've produced a play from their stories. Our verbatim play, October 7th, consists entirely of eyewitness accounts of that day, only using the actual words of those who lived through it. The world wants you to forget about what happened that day, the day that everything changed. We refuse to let that happen. October 7, the play is opening in New York and will bring you the truth they don't want you to hear. Get your tickets now for October 7, the play at october7theplay.com, running May 2nd to June 16th in New York. That's October 7th, theplay.com. Thank you. So I think that sums up what we're doing. When we were in Ireland and in Europe, and even since then, we've noticed everyone wants to talk about, even on October 8th, they wanted to talk about Gaza and the electric being turned off. They didn't want to talk about October 7. They don't want to talk about October 7, which is the exact reason why we say you should talk about October 7, because there was a ceasefire on October 6. Do you remember that? Uh, there would be no need for a ceasefire if it wasn't for October 7. There'd be no need for a ceasefire if the hostages were released. There'd be no need for a ceasefire if Hamas surrendered. But they're not going to do that. So we want people to remember, as they say in Hollywood, the origin story. Uh, for the war in Gaza. So that's why October 7th, we went to Israel in November, interviewed about 20 people, boiled their stories down to about 13 different accounts, little snippets of their day or little snippets of October 6th, and then what happened to them on October 7th, and then how they feel about October 7th. It's uh, It has a beginning, middle and end. It's a great play. It tells the truth. Uh, we recently had a table read with some actors in New York. Most of the actors were crying at the end, most of them. Um, so always a good sign when your actors are crying over your script. They were laughing too. There's, there's a lot of humor. Uh, I, do, I think it must be. I mean, I know everyone finds humor in the darkest places, but I'll tell you the Jewish people, they find they've had, they've had a lot of dark places, but boy, do they find humor. So there was there's even jokes in it. Um, and just to remind you, I didn't write the jokes. The, the play is 100% verbatim written, or it's the voices of people who lived through it, Israel's darkest day. So it's very gripping. Uh, people were crying at the end. Ob obviously, in every room, you're going to get one woke actor who, um, or one woke person who, I won't even say what they said. It's just, people, people are strange. People are strange. Um, and people, People don't understand verbatim. People don't understand that if somebody says something not very nice in a verbatim play, you, that's the reason you keep it in. You don't cut the line. But anyway, we're, we're moving on. We have a we have 
almost almost fully cast. Some of the actors weren't available after the reading, so we're we are almost fully cast now with new actors or some of the same actors. It's going to be a great production. Um, so please go to October Seven The Play dot com october 7 the play.com obviously it's costing a lot of money to put the production on if you can't come to the event uh, consider donating there's a donation button button there we're not for profit we couldn't do this without your support you've been you came up to the plate many times to help us make my son hunter make the gosnell movie help us write the gosnell book the gosnell podcast all all the great work we've done and we're asking for your help again, so please go to October 7, theplay.com and give what you can. In other news, the Trump trial, when you see this, the Trump trial, it probably won't have opened. It's, it's a, they're, they're selecting a jury. That's going to take probably two weeks. Um, I'm with Mark Stein on this. Go and read Mark Stein at, at Stein Online today. He he looks at how Don, it's Donald Trump is go, has been refused permission to go to Barron's high school graduation, his son Barron's high school graduation. Now, I, I also share Mark Stein's contempt of the uh, of how Americans graduate from everything. You know, you, you leave kindergarten and you get a graduation gown and a certificate, uh, you know. And in where I come from, graduation was something that people who left university did. But here in America, you graduate from everything. You graduate from kindergarten. You graduate from middle school. You graduate. You graduate. That's why there's all these when people get shot by the police. There's all these photographs of them in a graduation gown with a graduation cap. And like they, you know, I would suggest that the graduation process was not too rigorous for, for many of the people who graduated. But that's a different matter. So he's not. The judge has said he can't go to a son Baron graduation. Mark Stein said conservatives are wrong talking about the legalisms of this trial, the, the ins and outs. This is a banana republic attempt to take out your political opponent. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing legal about it. It is a contemptuous uh, event. And Mark Stein says Trump should go to Barron's graduation. And, and and take the wrath of the court. Be contemptuous. Be literally contemptuous and be sorry, be metaphorically contemptuous and literally contemptuous. Be get involved in contempt of court. Uh, we were at the Michael Mann versus Stein uh, trial in New York in Washington. And in the opening statement, as Mark Stein says, in the opening statement, the lawyer said, Oh, Michael Mann, because of his rigorous teaching schedule, won't be here every day of the trial. And he wasn't. That was Michael Mann, a a, a fake professor at a f in a fake scientific rigor. He's not fake professor. He probably is a professor, but you know, a fake expert in a fake scientific field. Uh, and he didn't turn up for his trial every day, uh, and that was no problem. So, as uh, as Mark Stein says, this is two months. This trial could last two months. He's take. They are taking a candidate for the presidency of the United States away from campaigning for two months. Trump should just arrange a political rally. He should go to his son's graduation and say, you know, I'll, I'll take I'll take the slings and arrows when I come back. So uh, that's you can go to Stein online, see what Mark Stein has said in full. You can go to climate change trial unfiltered to hear our coverage of the Mark Stein Michael Mann trial. We're still getting amazing emails, amazing text messages about our coverage of the trial. Uh, it's one of our best pieces of work, and uh, it's a it's a historical record of of an issue that needs to that the hard questions needed to be asked. And I think this trial really asked it. The, the result was not what justice should have demanded, but that's the problem with the DC jury, and it's the problem that Trump's going to have with a New York jury, but as Mark Stein says, look, this is a corrupt process from beginning to end, so we shouldn't worry about a jury. Uh, you know, we, we should expect that, that the corrupt process is going to uh, wind its way through the judicial system, um, but we, and we should treat it with contempt. And talking of Israel, obviously last weekend saw the missile attacks on on Israel from Iran and 
people, you know, it's an off, often the thing that's said, you know, if, if Trump was in power, they wouldn't attack or this wouldn't happen or that wouldn't happen. I actually have evidence of that. I actually can tell you in from inside the Oval Office why that is true. So on the 29th of February 2020, as someone described to me, the last happy day in the White House before the pandemic, we were in the Oval Office with one President Trump. There's the pictures. Uh, we Our play, FBI Lovebirds Undercovers, was being shown at CPAC. We were invited to the Oval Office to meet President Trump in advance of the play. There's Dean Cain, Christy Swanson, myself, Anne. And we you remember FBI Lovebirds Undercovers. That was the play about Strzok and Page, the rogue FBI agents who tried to destroy the Trump candidacy and then the Trump presidency by using fake FBI investigations, uh, trying to push the Russia collusion hoax. It was just after Trump had assassinated Soleimani, the leader of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, and the Iranians had responded. Remember, they responded kind of strangely. Like this was the, the Americans had assassinated, you know, a hero, a martyr. A, a, you know, a man responsible for spreading Iranian death and destruction across the planet. And they fired two missiles at military bases in Iraq and missed. They, now, some soldiers said they were injured, but it was all, it was, no one, there was no one seriously injured. They missed a couple of missiles and they missed, and it was very strange. And tr when we were there, Trump said to us, yes, we told them, under my orders, we told them, if you harm an American or an American soldier, we will destroy your Navy. That's what they were told. They were said, you have a choice. If you want to retaliate, you go right ahead. We will destroy your Navy. Now, the Iranian Navy is a very, very important part of its military. It controls the Suez Canal. <clears throat> it controls the Suez Canal. Uh, it 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 has an outsized influence on the world. If the Iranian Navy wants to mess around, it can push oil prices up. It can destroy the Saudi economy. It can it can it can really mess things up. It's a really important stick that they have, the, the Iranian Navy. And Trump said, "We will destroy your Navy." Now, of course, Americans can do that. And as we've seen uh, in Ukraine and Russia, boats because of these supersonic missiles now boats are just floating coffins for sailors now. They just don't have the defences, and especially the Iranian embassy does not have the defences to combat American missiles and American drones. So they were told, don't do not do this. They they did some desultory uh, missiles and missed on purpose, and then it was forgotten about it. There was no further follow-up on uh, retaliation for Soleimani's death. We were told the Arab street was going to go crazy. And the Arab Street just went shopping. Uh, so now we have Israel uh, in Gaza. And Iran is quite happy to telegraph in advance that they're going to fire missiles at Israel. And th they will do it. And uh, the difference is Joe Biden is in the White House uh, and not Donald Trump. That is the difference. That is why Iran feels they can attack a sovereign nation, another sovereign nation with missiles and drones because Joe Biden is there and Joe Biden is weak and Donald Trump was not weak. Donald Trump did the unthinkable. He assassinated Soleimani. Uh, everyone predicted uh, hell, on, uh, hell on wheels. It didn't happen. They predicted retaliation. It didn't happen because he warned the Iranians, we will destroy your navy, and they realized that 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 he was they realized first of all that he was serious he had already done the unthinkable and he would do it again so that's the difference when people say to you that wouldn't happen when if Donald Trump was in the White House sometimes it's politics sometimes it's politics in this I can tell you from first ha a first hand account of of the inside the White House uh, after the um, Iranians did their fake retaliation that it definitely wouldn't have happened under Donald Trump. So talking of Israel, I want to go over now to the interview I did earlier with Dr. Abraham Weiner. Uh, you may remember Dr. Weiner from the Mark Stein trial. He was the statistician who proved that 
that the hockey stick was basically a fake graph, uh, that it was a graph where people wanted a result and chose the data to match the result, consciously or unconsciously, by the way. Um, now, he's he's an amazing statistician. He's an amazing, he's the guy who predicted all the Grammy winners one year. He'll tell you, tell you all about that. He just uses numbers, past behavior. He just understands how things work because he's dispassionate. We saw this article by him in the tablet, which was, which it just was gobsmacking, and we feel it hasn't had the publicity it deserves, but it may have had an effect. He basically, the article was, yeah, we all know Hamas lied, but I can actually prove that their figures of 30,000 dead in Gaza are are lies, and, he, and here's the proof. So without further ado, I really, I want you to meet this guy. I hope he, I hope we're going to have a long chat, um, and also... I hope he comes back on the show many times. We could have him on every week. He's a great, great statistician, and uh, we need more people in the world like him, not less. So let's go over to the interview I did earlier with Dr. Abraham Weiner. Thanks. We're joined now by Dr. Abraham Weiner. Um, those of you who listen to the Climate Change on Trial, the Michael Mann versus Mark Stein trial podcast, will remember him as one of our favorite parts of the trial. We're so thrilled to bring him to you now in person rather than an actor's voice, which is how you heard him previously because we did reenactments. Um, and then you'll get to see why we we liked him so much, why we liked what he said in the trial so much. Um, so welcome to the show, Dr. Weiner. Yeah, great to be here. Um, I, I just want to give our viewers a, a bi you know, a, a summary of, of just who you are. You know, you're a professor of statistics at the Wharton School of Business, the chair of the undergraduate program in statistics and data science at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, you have bachelor degrees in mathematics from Yale, uh, PhD in statistics from Stanford, and dozens of peer-reviewed publications. Um, you you can tell us more about, about your career. As I say, we first became acquainted with you uh, when you testified as the expert as an expert witness in the Mark Stein trial, where you called into question the data analysis of Michael Mann. Um, thanks for thanks for coming on the show, Dr. Weiner. Oh, it's good to be here. We're here to talk to you about a recent article you published in Tablet Magazine uh, about, and it's it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's it's a there's a graph in it that I think should be put on every billboard on the planet, uh, and we'll come to that. I just wanted to talk to you about. The Stein trial, actually, just initially. Um, sure, I haven't been talking about that very much. <laughs> Not recently, anyway. Just, just, I just, I just want to pass. You know, first of all, how did you think your act, the actor, represented you as a, as a, as, as a voice? Oh, I thought the voice was not very much not me. I, I have worked on my radio voice over the years, and I didn't think uh, the actor quite captured that. But you know, I can't complain. I didn't listen to all of it, so. Very good. Okay. Well, I mean, it was obviously a very interesting result. Um, most people listening to the trial felt that definitely the Michael Mann graph was was called into question from from a new a number of different uh, ways, a number of different ways. But in the end, the jury decided against Michael against Mark Stein. Perhaps well, it, there was at one point in my in my cross examination. I don't know whether this came across in the in your podcast. Um, Michael Mann's lawyers went through all the counts that were charged against uh, Ram Sinberg, who was actually my client, and Mark Stein, who was was who was actually not my client. And what I was testifying was only on one of the six of them, or maybe it's one of the eight. Um, and they did a very good job of sort of bounding the what I was talking about into a little bit of a corner and giving them much more a leeway to talk about all the others, which really aren't scientific in nature. And so the one count that I was really called to to testify on was the count of, you know, manipulating the data to keep the blade on the hockey stick. I think that's how it actually read. Um, and I think it's interesting. I don't know if you pointed it out, but he didn't win on that count. That's correct, actually. And and even Rand Simberg, the jury found one dollar in compensatory damages, and I think it was $10 in punitive damages. We could talk about the Mark Stein trial for all day, but actually I really want to talk about 
your recent article in the tablet magazine. And the title of the article is How the Gaza Ministry of Health Fakes Casualty Numbers. Yes, that's right. Although I, I personally, I didn't actually in, write up the title. That The tablet magazine did that. Yes, yes. And you start off talking about how how the 30,000 deaths, and I suppose it's it's probably more now, but, but also that Hamas have also revised it downwards. We'll come to that in a moment. But when you wrote this article several weeks ago, 30,000 deaths, uh, initially media organizations were just quoting it as, as a fact. Then under pressure, they said 30,000 deaths, according to the Gaza Ministry of Health figures. You point out that, uh, that the numbers are not real. They cannot, the, the, the rate of death, well, actually, you tell us why those numbers so, are so, not real. Yeah, why don't, I, why don't I tell you with the, almost the history of the numbers. So almost from October 7th and onward, daily, they were publishing numbers of casualties. And um, by the, towards the end of October, they were breaking down the, Octo the casualty counts into categories, men, women, and children. And they continued that for a while. Then, of course, they stopped while continuing to put out total numbers of, of casualties. And in the beginning, there was this, uh, in the media, there was a lot of um, uh, questioning of the reliability of the results, that the numbers were coming out incredibly quickly, um, and that didn't make sense. And also, there was a hospital that was bombed, allegedly bombed by Israel on October 17th, that the Ministry of Health reported 501 deaths, and uh, Israel was able to demonstrate that they were not responsible, and then it was shown also that the the uh, the rocket that did hit the the hospital turned out hit the parking lot. It was from the Islamic Jihad, and it may have killed one fifth or even fewer people than reported. But that didn't change Hamas's numbers in their in their statistics. And so, in the beginning, the numbers were being put out with a little bit of skepticism in the in the mainstream press. But as time went on, and the imagery that was coming out seemed to be so hostile to Israel's war effort, then then the the numbers stopped being um, quant uh, qualified as this, as if first first they were saying it mixes up civilians and, and, and fighters and it's coming from Hamas. And after a while, they just dropped the number as if it were pure civilians. And in fact, sometimes you would hear media say there are over 30,000 civilians have been killed in Gaza. So, and there, and that's where it, it was sort of heading. And the reason why this is so important and why I actually was interested in the numbers in the first place the reason why the, the calculations are so interesting and important is not because I'm here to minimize the extent of civilian damages that are and casualties that are happening in Gaza, because they are extensive. And you can't, you know, you can't pretend that that's not actually happening. The problem is, is that when you have inaccurate numbers, and more importantly, you don't actually accurately account for the number of men, what you're doing is you're giving the false impression that Israel is indiscriminately bombing. And that they're not fighting a war, but they're just dismantling a, an urban population. So Hamas's numbers include 72% of their 30,000, 30,000 plus at this point, women and children. And why that's a problem is that that's actually the population percentage. And so if you accept their numbers, there's no room for Hamas fighters in that total, which gives sustenance to the idea that Israel is simply uh, murdering civilians that is not actually fighting the war. So, sorry, but to, Israel, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. C could you explain that again about the 72%? It just, uh, it's important, and I, I, I'm not sure I, I understand it. Oh, it's, it's, actually, it's actually the whole motivation for writing the article in the first place. So 72% uh, of Gaza civilians are women and children. Half of the population is civilian and just under, uh, sorry, half of the population is children. And then the remaining half is women. So you get about 72% of Gazan civilian population is, is women and children. And so if the casualty count, the total casualty count, matches the population civilian count, there's no room for fighters. and Or fighters are therefore very minimal. And that buttresses the claim that Hamas has been making, or at least as allowing some people to make on their behalf, that Israel's not actually taking out any of their uh, battalions of fighters, of which there are about 24, of uh, which th well, thousands of fighters in each. But Israel, of course, has claimed that they've dismantled all but four of their, or five of their battalions, having essentially killed 19 out of 24 battalions and tens of thousands of Hamas fighters. So if you trust Israel's numbers, 
then the numbers of civilian casualties are in the ratio approximately one to one, maybe it's slightly more than one to one civilians to fighters. If you accept the numbers as given by Hamas, then it is a completely misleading impression of what's going on. What's happening in Israel is a war, Israel, a war between Israel and Hamas. It is not a series of war crimes, and it is certainly not genocide. And the numbers are sitting at the center of that. Well, I mean, am I, am I correct in saying then, if you accept the Hamas figures, Israel is involved. Every bomb they're dropping is indiscriminate because it, 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 it exactly kills the, the, the civilian population. There is actually no targeting of Hamas fighters in, uh, under the Hamas well, figures. Well, or, or Hamas will say that their fighters are particularly good at evading the, um, the bombs. They're, they seem to be pretty good. Um, so th that's, that's the first dodgy t statistic. Can I bring you on to that graph, which to me, it's just, it's you just- You can, although I want to, before we get to the graph, I, I think it's important to recognize that the Hamas actually, by middle of February, admitted to having lost 6,000 of its fighters. And that already sets up a contradiction because if they're claiming 72% civilians and women and admitting 6,000 fighters and recognizing 30,000 or so deaths, there's no re room for all this to make sense. So when I published my article, it was already a priori wrong. We just had to figure out in what ways was it wrong. And it was it couldn't possibly be, and particularly if you want to trust Israel's numbers, and there's no reason why you shouldn't, Israel historically has been very uh, approximately accurate with its um, count of, of Hamas fighters' deaths. In fact, Hamas has never been particularly um, accurate about counting its own soldiers. In previous encounters with Israel, they tend to un uh, undercount the soldiers that die by a factor of 10. And I believe that's what they're doing again, um, at least when they reported just a, hundreds of, of, of fighters died. It's, it's in the tens of thousands. So yes, now you want to talk about the graph. Yeah, I mean, actually, I'm, I'm glad you, you you brought up that other point. So, so yeah, if there's 6,000 fighters, I mean, it's then Israel's bombs are incredible. So they, they're able to, they don't kill any male civilian Palestinians then. Is that, so the bomb goes in, kills Palestinian fighters and women and children to an exact proportion as they are of the population. So therefore cannot kill any male civilian. So the best thing to be, according to Hamas, in Gaza now is a male civilian. You're almost guaranteed to, uh, to, to live through this war. Yeah, and of course, and so at the time I wrote the article, I knew that there was something wrong, although I couldn't, I couldn't decide exactly what it was, but the article was written six weeks ago. And since then, there's been almost a flood of new information proving my point over and over again. In fact, just recently, I think it was just a couple of days ago, Hamas's own ministry admitted that for over 10,000 of the deaths, they don't have documentation. And interestingly enough, for the ones they don't have documentation, they're almost entirely women and children. So they're admitting that they just don't have any, the whole thing is rigged. Do you think your article spurred this or? or, or... You know, I'd like to think it, it certainly spurred it, but I would guess that this has been something that's been talked about widely. And there were a whole bunch of uh, articles written after mine, a wonderful article dismantling the data coming from UNRWA. Um, there was an article published in The Lancet that actually talked about UNRWA deaths, which is a UN organization, and that claimed that the proportion of UNRWA deaths are exactly matching Hamas's numbers. So therefore, these are actually correct. But someone eventually dug out the the demographic information about UNRWA's in, in general and the deaths, and they found that while UNRWA is disproportionately women, the deaths are overwhelmingly men, um, which completely doesn't make any sense if the UNRWA uh, employees are dying as civilians. Um, no, they're dying as fighters because many of UNRWA's um, men employees are actually Hamas. So that was an article that was written. There has been a whole bunch of them. There's been other analyses, and all of them point to the obvious and by now, at this point, obvious fact that what Hamas is telling you isn't true. And I want to make it clear that the most important thing about its lack of truthfulness is the proportions of women and children. They're overstating that probably by a factor of two. Let's go to this graph that I've been talking about. Um, put, let's put it up on the screen there. It's it's a perfect graph. You, it's 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 actually it's it's another hockey stick. Actually, it, it's it's. It's it's just it's, it's the kind of graph that you would want to show a, a genocide, a, a a relentless 
um, bombing for, for, since since October seventh. But tell 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 people what's wrong with that graph. So this graph is uh, is uh, tracks the number of deaths over about a sixteen day period, and it uh, marches along almost too perfectly upward, and that doesn't ma match what military experts say should it, it should look like. Obviously, it always has to go up because I'm ca tallying the total number of deaths. But it should go up in, in in fits and starts, where there are days where many people die and days where far fewer. Um, so it should have a bumpiness to it, which this graph really doesn't have at all. And in fact, it's interesting because there was data that they had released prior to that, which does look much more bumpy. But in that data, they don't break it down into men, women, and children. So I didn't use that data. Um, but afterwards, you can use that as almost a control group and show that this period of time where they were for, for, uh, reporting men, women, and children deaths, it just looks too perfect. It comes up, it goes up very, very steadily. It's not the same every day. It does move around a little bit, but not nearly as much as you'd expect it to move Move if, you'd, if this were an actual military casualties in the context of the incredible amount of variability that you would get in war. Yeah, I mean, look, anyone who knows anything about war or who's ever... I grew up during the Troubles in Northern Ireland, and you know there are periods of intense conflict, and there are periods uh, when people uh, do not get involved in conflict. Uh, there are people get smarter. Uh, people know how to avoid conflict. Uh, they, they take measures. This is just, and you know, this assumes that Israel is just doing the same thing every day for sixteen days. Really, that's what it's saying, you know, and it's like. Well, would 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 an army do that? Do they have the resources to do that? Um, do the, do the people that they're attacking not get smart and realize this is what they're doing? We need to, you know, we need to take alternative measures. We need to, uh, you know, uh, we need to evacuate. It, it's just it it defies common sense that the patterns of deaths would be as consistent as you say in the fog of war. That's my argument. Um, other people have actually tried to come up with other explanations for that graph, and I find them to be particularly, you know, incomplete or really not 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 substantive. So one of them is that they're just re they're just able to process only a certain number every day, and that's what gives it the uniformity. But that's of course not what the data is, is reported to be. It's supposed to be the people dying on those days. So you're already trying to you're giving Hamas more credit than they even claim themselves. And secondly, we don't see that because whenever when there was a ceasefire. You would expect if that were the case, there would be catch up, um, but that's not the case. Uh, co correct, correct. Yeah, good point. When there's a ceasefire, that the they would the administration would take over and then and report the excess deaths. Yeah. Um, do you think your analysis and the other analysis is making a difference? Do you think that Hamas are slightly on the back foot now? Do you think the government and the media are are are? Is there any more skepticism or is? Is it still, are people still? So I, I'm not sure. Um, that's That would be a, a media analyst's job to kind of investigate. I'm more or less seeing the news reports of the deaths generally say it's mixing civilian and fighters. I, I see that pretty consistently. Although, depending on who you're listening to, people will often just say such and such a number of killed without breaking it down. I mean, just to give you a benchmark, I just did some of this research. In the Ukrainian-Russian war, there's been hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people dying. That's well more than a factor of 10 compared to Gaza. And somehow that doesn't seem to make a dent on anybody's, you know, everyone's like, well, you know, it, it is what it is, right? Um, and most of the people dying out of the Russian side are soldiers, but on the Ukrainian side, the majority dying are civilians. Um, you don't see those numbers tossed around yet. Somehow, when it comes to what's going on in Gaza, there's an absolute lack of context, and these numbers are thrown out um, as if it's being used as a as as a as a cudgel to attack Israel. Um, and I, w is it successful? The counter arguments, I argue, probably not. Only insofar as I have a, a deep seated belief that you can never reason someone out of a belief that they haven't been using reason to get into in the first place. That's a very, very good point, actually. Yes, you can't reason someone out of an argument that they didn't use reason to get into in the first place. Yep, yeah, it's that, it's that thing. When the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? But if you didn't use facts to get there in the first place, well, then the facts changing, um, it's a belief. It's a faith-based system, I suppose. Right, I mean, so the general view for the people who tout these numbers indiscriminately and without without 
um, qualification, they believe that Israel is a genocidal regime that hates Arabs and wants to destroy them and doesn't recognize their rights as human beings. And um, and but this is, of course, the age old anti-Semitic idea that the Jews are, you know, horrible uh, uh, society um, destroying um, s- uh, subhuman uh, aliens and everyone else was is treated with humanity but when it comes to a Jewish state no they are they're they are they're genocidal murders well look I, I'm we're gonna push this graph out as much as possible um and we have been pushing it out as much as possible is it it's I think it's it's great because everyone if you showed that to a, a a farmer in Ireland, you know, or a you know a bricklayer in London, and they said, you know, what do you think of this? They get it. It's that's not the way the world works. You know, road traffic accidents don't happen like that. Um, you know, farming accidents don't happen like that. Building sites accidents don't happen like that. You know, it's it's weather related. It's busyness related. It's you know, there's so many different. Um, different factors and variables and and to, for for in, in the middle of a war in a densely urban environment for these figures to come out like this it it just doesn't smell right and we need to get this graph out as much as possible yeah but i think the it's it's equally easy to explain to someone that hamas is reporting no fighters um and they're also now also reporting that there are fighters and they can't have it both ways and uh and it's it's really impossible to make sense out of Hamas's numbers. Okay, well, Dr. Weiner, thank you very much for for coming on the show. Um, I'd love to talk. To, we'd love to talk to you more actually about the Mark Stein trial, but we felt this was uh, this was too important to to, to let pass. Um, you're doing you're doing amazing work, um, and I know you talked in the trial about predicting who was going to win the Grammys, and you were totally successful on that. Um, well, I, I mean, in fairness, in my in the trial, the only thing I did was talk about an article I wrote over ten years ago, and just to describe its contents. It was easy for me to to uh, have a have at it because I just was re- recapitulating academic work that I did years back. Yeah, uh, I mean, and, and I know it might seem trivial when we're comparing Gaza to who's going to win the Grammy. So, just to explain to everyone, uh, uh, Dr. Weiner was asked to look at who had won the Grammys before and what they'd done and I suppose the, the statistics behind it and he used that to predict who was going to win the Grammys at the next Grammys and was was 100% correct is that correct? I think in the major categories it's not that big of an achievement I did it 20 years ago and if you look at the names of the people who won they're super famous one of them was Beyonce um, even though it was earlier in her career um, it was it was just a fun exercise yes but but I think you know I think it shows the power of of analyzing data dispassionately because I'm, I'm not sure you're a big Beyonce fan or whatever, you know, so you were looking at it dispassionately. You were looking at I, it from... at the time. I never even heard of her. It was embarrassing for all around. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, you know, it represents what you can do with data. If you look at it dispassionately, if you're not, if you, if you peel away all the, all the noise um, and, you know, we need more of that, not less of it. And uh, we're going to put the link to your tablet article up. We're going to make sure that uh, people see this graph. We're going to push it out on Twitter. So thank you very much for coming on the show, Dr. Weiner. And please keep doing what you're doing. It's my pleasure. Take care. Thank you. I just want to put this graph up one more time. I know everyone's probably sick of it now, but look at that graph. It's so obviously fake. It's so obviously fake. Um, And the world's media just take these figures as if they're gospel. Um, Amazing. So I want to now go over to an interview we did earlier with Dr. Ingrid Scope of the Charlotte Lozier Institute. Um, there's a lot. We what really we the reason we wanted to talk to her was this ad that was sent out by the Biden campaign. Let, let's just play the ad now. So this is one of our willow boxes. This is just filled with some of the things that we had started gathering for her while I was pregnant. Yep. There's her little baby book. This is the outfit that she was gonna maybe wear home from the hospital. Now all of these. Um, this is the blanket that she was in. Her, her little footprints. It's okay. No. 
I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. So there you go. I mean, sounds sounds dramatic, doesn't it? But something just doesn't smell right. They're confusing the word miscarriage with abortion. Uh, why would a doctor send someone home who's had a miscarriage? What, what, where, where did, what about the sepsis? It, it, there's just a lot going on there, and uh, it's confusing. And I always find when it's confusing that someone is lying. So let's go over to the interview Anne and I did earlier to, to find out the truth about the misinformation about abortion. So Dr. Ingrid Scope is a practicing OBGYN with over 30 years of experience. And she's also the Vice President and Director of Medical Affairs for the Charlotte Lozier Institute. Uh, Dr. Scope was in private practice uh, for 25 years in San Antonio, where she delivered over 5,000 babies, a, a, a small achievement, um, <laughs> and has also helped many women who have been harmed by abortion. Thank you very much, Dr. Scope, for joining us on the Anne Film Scoop. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Thank, Thank you so you. much. So I just wanted to let everyone know what we can and can't talk about. Uh, we, we're a not-for-profit and, uh, and you work for a not-for-profit, so we're not allowed to talk about candidates for elections or even recommend a candidate, or and we're not going to do that. But We have no interest in doing that. But what prompted us to reach out to you was the recent election ad from Joe Biden uh, for Joe Biden's uh, re-election. And we're, we want your expertise, because we're not experts, right? But some, something just is not right with um, with this ad. It just uh, let me read out. Let me read out some of the lines from it. And I know I know you're probably very familiar with this. And there's a woman, and you see her, and it's all ver you know uh, very beautifully shot and all that. At 18 weeks, Amanda's water broke. We're told she's there with her husband. They're looking through baby photographs and and things that they had pre prepared for their pregnancy. Um, and it goes on to say, and because no, no, sorry, Phil. Yeah, at on. eighteen weeks, Amanda's water broke. She had a miscarriage. Oh, yeah. at, at at eighteen weeks, so start, uh, yeah. yeah, at eighteen weeks, Amanda's water broke. She had a miscarriage, and it goes on to say, because Donald Trump killed Roe v. Wade, Amanda was denied standard medical care to prevent infection, comma, comma, an abortion. So yeah, I think we just stop right there. Yes, we'll stop right there and ask a medical expert to tell us. This seems very odd language to us. Can you break this down for us and tell us what you think it means? I think it's important to recognize that the um, the terminology has been hijacked on the this politicized issue of abortion. So medically, um, there are two ways a pregnancy loss can occur early in pregnancy. One is what we call a spontaneous abortion, which is what you know is a miscarriage. This is where a child has tragically been lost. Mm -hmm. And um, we see it's so devastating for the family. I think you can recognize that in this in this advertisement. Amanda has been harmed. She's lost a, a child that she loved dearly. But it's being conflated with induced abortion, which is an action that is taken with the intent to end an unborn life. So it's very important, I think, to uh, define our terms. Um, the one reason that they are conflating the two is that the um, the procedures um, that are used to provide an induced abortion to end a life electively are the same procedures in many cases that are used when that life has tragically ended. So early in pregnancy, we see the use of drugs. Um, later in pregnancy, drugs can be used to induce labor. Uh, we see different surgical procedures, um, early a DNC, later a, a dilation and evacuation, which is a dismemberment procedure. That's ab that's abortion. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Scope. That's that's abortion you're talking about. Well, now. it can be it can be used for either as an intervention for either type of, of pregnancy loss. So in a tragic event like Amanda had where she was in the process of miscarrying her baby, the doctors could have performed either an induction to deliver her um, or they could have used um, a procedural um, um, what's called a, you know a, a, an abortion procedure because again it, in the procedure the intent would be to end that life right away um, through dismemberment um, and the reality is this happened in Texas where I practice so I know the law well 
the law uh, would allow that intervention, whatever mm. the intervention was, whether it was adduction or whether it was abortion, it would have allowed it. But and 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 doctors again, it's important to recognize ninety percent of obstetricians do not do elective abortions, and yet we have all been willing to intervene to protect a woman's life if her pregnancy posed a risk. And certainly in Amanda's case, her pregnancy did pose a risk because she was developing an infection. She needed to be delivered. But what has happened, again, because this is such a politicized issue, is that doctors don't understand the law. There has been intentional misinformation, both from pro-abortion media and from pro-abortion medical organizations, I'm, a, a, I'm sorry to say, mm -hmm. that has confused doctors and so that they're not giving the care that they used to give. They're sitting on their hands. They're afraid. They've been told that they may lose their license. They may be charged with a felony. They may have a, a civil penalty. It's important to know no doctor in Texas has ever been prosecuted when he's performed an abortion for the life of the mother. So there's really no reason to suspect that's going to start happening. And yet the doctors are so fearful that in many cases, they have not intervened when they should. Well, so well, this is not the fault of the law. This is the fault of the fact that the doctors don't understand well, the law. They've been lied to about the law, mm -hmm. as have the American public. Well, of course, they're, of course, they're going to be confused. The president of the United States is is on TV, you know, on the internet, saying because Donald Trump killed Roe v. Wade, Amanda was denied standard medical care to prevent infection, comma, and abortion. And and when the president says that, you're thinking, well, that's obviously the law of the land. The, you know, and we're not getting into uh, who, who you should vote for or anything. But we have to, you know, uh, you you as an expert and we as journalists have to call out misinformation for different reasons. But for, for different from different we're coming at this from different angles. Yeah, yeah. But 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 we're, our, our goal is the same, that people should know the truth. Absolutely. And I believe that the American public really understood the issue. Um, again, they've been gaslighted for over 50 years. They do not understand the issue. Google's not pro-life. It's hard to even do your own research to find out what is true. Um, LozureInstitute.org, where I work, we have addressed this issue from so many different angles. And so there is good data to be had. But we need to recognize this is not essential reproductive health care. Again, 90% of obstetricians do not do elective abortions. We're women's health care professionals. If it was necessary, we would do it. We know it's not necessary. Um, and yet in these tragic events, if a, if a pregnancy is posing a risk to a woman's life, every state pro-life law allows an exception. So if an abortion is needed, the law allows that to be performed. But... Um, in 30 years of practice, 5,000 babies, I've never needed to intentionally kill a baby through an abortion in order to protect his mother. There have been times I've needed to induce labor in a, in a situation like Amanda's in order to protect the mother from infection. And sometimes, tragically, that baby has died. But that is not prohibited by any law. And I would argue that's not an abortion. My intent is not to kill the baby. Yeah. My intent is to protect his mother. And so, again, you know, this has been politicized. Um, one political party really wants to take away all safeguards protecting women. They want to allow abortions without restraint until the moment of birth. People say that doesn't happen, but it does. The CDC documents that about 1% of abortions occur after that baby can live separated from his mother. That's in the second half of pregnancy. That's about 10,000 a yes. year. So there's yeah. a lot of babies dying yeah. in our country, yeah. and they're I make, not. I make, yeah, I make that point all the time because people basically say, oh, it never happens, There's, you know, and exactly. I always use Guttmacher Institute's numbers because obviously Guttmacher is, uh, is your, you know, the, the, the opposite of what you are, but it's the, you know. The pro-abortion. The pro-abortion pro um, research arm of, of Planned Parenthood. And they say, as you exactly just said, they're 1%, which, okay. is, which is a massive number. Can I just, I just, can I back, just add? I just want to go back to this one. Can I, I just add one thing to that, though? Just one thing to that. Um, we know from our experience with Gosnell, lots of abortion clinics don't don't compile the data, don't send in the data. And it's not mandatory. And it's, it's not mandatory. And even when it's mandatory, there's no punishment if they don't do it. So the 1%, it, 
is is is, is a guesstimate. Well, it's a guess. I mean, it's it's the lowest. It's it's obviously much more because I suppose the later term abortion clinics are less likely to send in the documentation because it's a, you know everyone wants to look away from that. So it's more than one percent. So it's it's tens of thousands, and that's a reasonable estimate because uh, because of what we know and what people but but lots of people don't know sorry Anne, you wanted to say something. i want to go back no to that's the... a very good point like federally there are no mandates on any data related to abortion we don't know the numbers we don't know the complications and we don't know the deaths yeah and that's really important for people to recognize and the abortion industry has leveraged that lack of knowledge mm-hmm. yeah uh, to try to imply that it's safer than it actually is Actually, I've got a question. I, you may not know the answer to this. It's just something and I, it's something I definitely need to check out myself. I, I imagine the CDC requires mandatory reporting of all kinds of things that go on in hospitals or in medical clinics. Um, I, I'm just curious because they don't mandate this. Is there something like what what do they mandate to report on? Is it like, I don't know, I suppose vaccinations maybe or I mean, is there anything um trivial that they um, that they actually mandate gets reported? Well, through the CDC specifically, I can't really say because a lot, and we saw this in COVID, a lot of their data regarding vaccine injuries, et cetera, is also voluntarily okay. reported through the adverse events reporting system, which, so, so I, I think people are usually surprised to discover that there are not high quality systems in place to detect um, complications on many types of drugs but um yeah it's just important it's important to recognize that data is not being collected there's a yeah. reason it's not being collected Correct. because yeah. it, if it were collected if the, if the american public really knew how frequently complications occur for example um with these abortion drugs the fda's own data tells us that one out of 25 women go to an emergency room within a month and um considering there were 630,000 the Guttmacher tells us whether it's true or not, but, you know, they do tend to have uh, about 50 percent more abortions they report than the CDC does. Again, just showing how bad the, the data collection <laughs> yeah, is. Yeah, unbelievable. But, um, yeah, so so they're, they're working on limited data, um, and um, we should, as a, as a people, we should insist on better quality data. Yeah. I just want to go back to the ad again because I just just to really clarify, it says because Donald Trump killed Roe v. Wade, Amanda was denied standard medical care to prevent infection, comma, an abortion. If you have had a miscarriage, how can you have an abort? How can you abort a baby that has already miscarried? Surely that that am I, am I correct in saying that that to me is a logical that's illogical, completely illogical. The baby it is, is illog- already- Yeah, it's illogical, and the, and the, and we've seen that that they are. You, you see media reports of women who have been diagnosed with a baby that has died inside, and yet still you see reports that they're not being treated. What happened in Amanda's case was an incomplete miscarriage. So she was in the process of miscarrying. Her water bag had broken, which did place her at risk of infection. The baby was still alive, but the baby was being, you know, in the process of being delivered. Um, however, not close enough to, act, I mean, she wasn't really in labor where the baby was going to come out quickly. And so in that situation, doctors do, it's a difficult situation because again, so many times these are desperately desired children. This is a heartbreaking situation. And again, it is unconscionable that women's heartbreaking situations are being leveraged for a political agenda, which is what we're seeing. But the Texas law allows, does not say that the risk has to be immediate, but says if there is a risk to the woman's life, the doctor can intervene. And when we look at ACOG, which is the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, they have a practice bulletin specifically on the issue that Amanda was encountering, this this pre-viable, premature rupture of membranes, where they say three things are appropriate. One is immediate delivery by induction. One is immediate delivery by abortion, and one, if the woman is not infected, is to wait and see what happens. So sometimes, rarely, but sometimes the babies can make it to a gestational age. But again, it's all part of the informed consent counseling. The woman should be should be aware of the three different situations. Texas allows any of those three different options to be chosen by the woman and the doctor. And in fact, because we do... Um, 
require reporting on this, I would let you know that since the Dobbs decision, there have been 71 abortions performed in Texas for the life of the mother. So some doctors have figured it out. Sadly for Amanda, her doctor did not figure it out. Her doctor waited too long. She went to the ICU with a serious blood infection, and it has been alleged that she may have permanent damage to her reproductive tract. That was not required by the state law. The state law would have allowed intervention, and sadly, she's being used by abortion advocates that are trying to destroy the laws completely. So they don't want to just clarify the law. They want to get rid of the law so that they can abort healthy babies and healthy women up until the time of birth. And that's yeah. what those ballot initiatives that we're seeing will yes. allow. So people it's, need to recognize that. It's very similar to the Irish case, Savita, where, um, where Savita Halabanapper, where she, I mean, I, you know, I don't know the, the full details. Again, she, she had a, a miscarriage and they, they didn't recognize the sepsis quick enough. Our Irish medical system seems to have a problem with sepsis and she died of sepsis. And, uh, the allegation was that, that they that they couldn't take the baby out because of Ireland's strict abortion laws. It, it wasn't true, but um, but it, it no, it it's wasn't a good, true. It's a good from story. what I've read that she was very very sick, and the doctors watched her get sick, and so we cannot allow that to happen in our country. We've got to educate Americans about what these laws allow, and um, they do allow doctors to intervene. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, on a wider on a wider look at the at, at the at the way the world is now we hear a lot about abortion is health care this is the new line is it health care uh, no of course it's not health care i mean health care is maintenance and restoration of the body and mind delivering babies is health care um ending human life which of course is what an abortion does is not health care um again as i said occasionally there, you need to uh, separate a mother and her unborn child for a risk to the mother's life, but that's not an abortion as legally defined. The intent is not to end that child's life. And 90% of obstetricians um, approximately do not perform elective abortions. If it were health care, of course, we would perform it, but we don't because we know it's not health care. The, the narrative comes from very pro-abortion medical organizations but this is not evidence-based. Evidence-based means that there has been some serious studies that have proven better outcomes after abortion than carrying a child to term. There has never been a high-quality study that has proven that. Hmm. The best the abortion industry can try to do using that very incomplete data that we talked about is say we don't think it causes a significant risk. But even so, when you look at better quality data from European countries, we know that a woman is six times as likely to commit suicide in the year following an abortion than if she'd given birth to her child. Wow. And we know that other medical, uh, they're two to four times as likely to die of any cause. So the, the, the reality is um, childbirth is very safe. It's been demonized, but it is very, yeah. very safe. Yeah. Yeah. And we doctors are doing, we're, we're trying our hardest to, to prevent any death from ever occurring during childbirth. And we've done an amazing job. Mm -hmm. And yet this, these, these false narratives keep coming back, frightening women into thinking that childbirth is so dangerous that they need to abort their child. And I'll have to say specifically, this has been targeted at the black population. This is a very, very eugenic action. Black women do have higher maternal mortality rates, but you know what? They have three times the abortion rates of white women. So they're being abortion is being promoted to them for eugenic reasons. It's not protecting them. If it was protecting them, we would not see that their abortion rates are so high. Obviously, uh, those I, I two things cannot be true at the same time. You've you've worked in, in the area as an OBGYN for, for, for decades. And I think one of the things that you focused on is, and I, you've kind of hinted a little bit at it there, at damage done to women, women who've had abortions and they, that, that the, outco the outcomes afterwards and how they've how, how their lives are afterwards, which gets very, very little attention. Um, tell us what you've experienced in your in your career in terms of outcomes after abortions for women. Well, I've seen women harmed in so many different ways. And for one thing, our bodies are biologically primed to bond with our children. So a woman who becomes pregnant, her, 
despite what her mind thinks, she's bonding already with that baby hormonally. And we know from survey data that women who with a history of abortion, more than half of them said they would have preferred to give birth if they'd had support. So what is happening is that men are leaving the scene. These men who created these babies are not willing to raise them. These women are alone. They feel unsupported. And many times they're in, in a crisis and they, and they, it has been promoted to them as the only solution to their crisis. And, um, and so these women, they may fall into this action. There's often immediate regret. There's often long-term guilt. As I mentioned, mental health complications, self-harm, substance and alcohol abuse, high risk-taking behaviors. Those all happen to women as a direct effect of the guilt that they feel from an abortion. Yeah. And then we also see that it has torn up our society and our families. Prior to Roe, 11% of women who gave birth were unmarried moms. Today, it's 40%. In the black population, it's nearly 70%. So we see what this has done. This it, being painted as a woman's issue has allowed men to very rapidly leave the scene and leave women who want to carry their babies as single moms in poverty at risk for maternal mortality. So all of these things are happening. It's a very complex issue. Yeah. But it's being painted as a simple, you know, yeah. erroneous and, and dishonestly as a healthcare issue, when in fact it is social engineering and is often motivated by eugenics and population yeah. control. Yeah, it, it just occurred to me a couple of things you said there. Um, you talked about the, the figure, and we've seen this a lot, that black women have have higher maternal death rates. Did you say three times the maternal death rate? Yeah. Uh, but again, of course, they have they have a very, very high abortion rate. And, you know, if you have an abortion, wouldn't that affect, doesn't that affect your your ability to give birth? I'm just speaking as, as a layman here, you know, your ability to give birth. And then you also say when you have abortions, you know, you, you get you indulge in risk taking behavior, and maybe substance abuse again, because of the high abortion rate in in the black communities, is that not a a a, a causation or a, a connection anyway uh, to the high maternal death rate? I mean, do you know any? Is there any statistics? Yeah, absolutely. On that? I mean, there's there's a lot to break down there. For one thing, a later abortion is much more dangerous. The yeah. CDC has documented that when a woman has an abortion in the second half of pregnancy, she's seventy six times as likely to die from a direct complication of that abortion. And we see that often black women are more likely to have later abortion. And, and if we look more closely, we see that often that is under coercion. Yeah. So that is, a, that is a big problem. But the action of a surgical abortion, um, good quality studies tell us that can increase a woman's risk of preterm delivery of a subsequent pregnancy. It can also increase the risk of an abnormal placental attachment, which can be associated with catastrophic bleeding. So it puts future pregnancies at risk. But again, we're doing very little to try to track that type of data. But as I mentioned, by tearing up the family, by causing so many of these women to live in poverty as single mothers, everybody knows that is a risk factor for maternal mortality. So all of these things are happening that increase the risk in that population and yet not being acknowledged. And again, the simple solution by the abortion lobby is go ahead and abort your baby because we can't protect you when you give birth, which of course is, is dishonest and untrue. Um, and, um, and there's obviously an ideology and a motivation behind that type of a discussion. I want to move over to the issue of abortion pills because I, now that we have you, we want to get as much information as we can. Obviously there's been an enormous amount of conversation about this, the availability, the uni almost what, what looks like universal access to these abortion pills. Can you tell us what does the abortion pill do and what safeguards are they putting in place to make sure that these I mean, what, what tell us tell us the story of these abortion pills, because it seems extraordinary to me that these are going to be just over the counter um, available all over the place or or sent by post to people all over the country. Yeah, absolutely. So the it's a two two drug regimen approved by the FDA in 2000. And uh, mifepristone blocks progesterone receptors, so it's, it ends that unborn child's life. And it's followed by mesoprostol that induces contractions in about 24 to 48 hours to expel the pregnancy tissue. 
terrible experience for women. They bleed heavily, usually for a couple of weeks. Almost half describe the pain as severe because they actually go into labor. And many of these women do see their aborted child. And yet the FDA broke its own rules. Um, they used accelerated approval regulations so they could rush to get in on the market again in the waning days of President Clinton's administration. And we actually see it was the Population Council that brought it to the United States. So there was a, you know, that population control ideology yes. was yes. there. But over time, the FDA has just removed critical safeguards. Um, under Obama, they extended its use. They said it doesn't need to be a doctor. And they took away the requirement for complication reporting. And then using COVID pandemic as an excuse, they removed the in-person supervision. So these can be ordered by telemedicine or online. Well, what happens online? You have no ability to do an ultrasound to rule out a potentially deadly ectopic pregnancy to make sure you know the gestational age because the FDA has only approved it to 10 weeks gestation to rule out a potentially deadly. I mean, there's just so many things that can happen to these women. They're not doing labs. They're not looking them in the eye to determine do they want an abortion. I and mean, just, when they're I, ordered online, who, we don't even know if it's a sex trafficker or a coercive man who's yeah. ordering them. So, yeah. You know, all of those things have happened. It's obviously um, really malpractice on the part of the FDA to remove these critical safeguards. And um, and that they're being hopefully held to account. Uh, there was a recent um, a lawsuit held at the Supreme Court, the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine versus the FDA, which is just asking, please put these safeguards back on. They're not even asking for the drugs to be taken off the market. They're just asking for the FDA to do its job to try to um, protect American women and girls from from the dangers of these drugs. Extraordinary. I mean, I'd actually, just to go back there, you said that there's kind of this two, this you know, there's two things that happen with that with that drug. Tell me, what what does it do to the baby? What how does it kill the baby? And what in what way does it do that? What what is so it? So pro, pro, progesterone, as its name implies, progestational hormone, it's critical to keep a pregnancy going. And mifepristone blocks the receptors. So it just cuts off the hormonal support completely, which, by the way, is the reason that if a woman regrets taking mifepristone, and women often do, we can give high dose progesterone and often we can reverse the, pro the process and uh -huh. save that baby's life. So th that's really the only good thing about it is that we know how to reverse that effect. But that's what mifepristone does. Mesoprostol induces labor. So women are, it's, this is being promoted to women as safer than Tylenol. And these young girls, they think, oh, you know, wow. I took a Tylenol, my headache went away. I can take this pill and I'm unpregnant. They don't realize they're going to go into labor. They're going to deliver their child. In many cases, they're going to see their child. That's how they're going to become not pregnant. And again, as we discussed, the complications are frequent. Um, even when it's used the way the FDA requires, six to eight percent of women will require surgery. Their body can't get rid of all that tissue. Many women hemorrhage. Um, and again, now that it's being allowed to be used without any verification of gestational age, we've got documentation. Uh, the Washington Post just last week published an article where they described women um, taking these pills beyond the gestational age where they should have taken describing seeing their children in the toilet, describing the the the, the umbilical cord hanging between the legs. This is happening, hmm. and it's you know um, it, the abortion the industry, of course, has Washington promoted Post. these drugs because it's an easier way to get abortions. They don't care that the women are collateral damage; they just are caring about ending that unborn life. Yeah, I have, a, I have another question, kind of. Um, so recently I've become aware that in high schools, in a lot of places in the United States, in high schools, sex education is being delivered. The materials, the resources that are provided are provided by Planned Parenthood. Um, what what are what is Charlotte Lozier doing to try to educate young people about the tr about the truth, about the medical situation um, around abortion? Are, are they able to to get into the high schools? You know, it it would be wonderful to have a very broad program to counteract Planned Parenthood because you're right. It's not just in the high schools. They're beginning these sex education programs at a um, elementary level. So we see this. They, they tell children that their gender is fluid and that, uh, you know, they teach them about sexual intercourse for pleasure. They know it's part of their plan that because contraception does fail, that the earlier you can get 
children sexually active, the more abortions you can sell them in a lifetime. That Planned Parenthood um, counts on the fact that approximately three abortions um, in a woman's lifetime because of contraceptive failure. Now, Charlotte Lozier, we are just about education, but on our website, we have a, a, a portion called The Voyage of Life that shows beautiful pictures and beautiful information about the development of that unborn human. Because we've discovered so many young women, even at college level, they don't even know. They don't know yeah. embryology. They're told it's so. a clump of cells and yeah. they believe it. And so the emotional devastation that comes from seeing your 10-week fetus, um, who's about the size and appearance of a gummy bear, clearly identifiable as a human being with arms, legs, a head, a face, they're surprised and devastated because they never, never expected the child to be that developed because they don't understand development. So Voyage of Life is a good start. People should look at that just to know what do these children look like at these early gestational ages. But sadly, we don't have the resources. Hopefully someone does to counter the Planned Parenthood indoctrination and brainwashing that comes about when they say they're teaching sex ed, but in fact, what they're doing is sexualizing children at an early age, knowing that that will lead to unintended pregnancies and abortions later. Oh, gosh. So, uh, yes. uh, no, not very much good news there, I yes, have to no, say, no. unfortunately. Um, well, thank you very much, Dr. Scope. I think we could talk... Uh, for a very long time but I, we really appreciate the work that Charlotte Lozier does to try to you know to try to counter these lies I mean it's very it's very challenging because um, the other side have the support of Hollywood they have the support of you know we just recently saw a Chicago Med episode very much you know de mirroring this story that's being used now yeah. in this ad campaign so it's you have you have a lot of work to do there and we're very grateful for your work uh, trying to counter all these lies thank you so much well, thank you for educating your listeners. That's all we can do is educate people. Help thank them you. understand thank the you. truth. All the best. Bye. So that was a great interview. You're going to hear a lot of misinformation going forward about abortion, especially as the election comes up. And the Democrats think this is a, a an election winning issue and the Republicans are running scared. So go to the Charlotte Lozier Institute website for the information. Read the Gosnell book. Listen to the Gosnell podcast, which the Gosnell podcast is called Serial Killer, a True Crime Podcast. Read the Gosnell book. Watch the Gosnell movie. Much of the Gosnell movie is based on the trial transcripts. Uh, the true background to Gosnell and the trial and information about abortion is in the Gosnell podcast. Over a million people have listened to the Gosnell podcast at the moment. So it's Serial Killer, a True Crime Podcast. You'll, you'll hear there's no misinformation there um, and we're very, very proud of it. So please listen there for, for all your information and you need as much information to combat the misinformation in the run-up to the election because Republicans are not going to help us on this. Uh, this, this they are running scared and uh, they're, you even see them adopting Democrat talking points. So you need to do your own research. It's very hard on Google. So go to the Charlotte Lozier website go to the Gosnell book go to the Gosnell podcast um, that's the end of the show today we will both be back next week we'll have more information about October 7th the play but uh, if you want we'll be updating the website regularly go to October 7 theplay.com especially if you want to donate or buy tickets if you know anyone in the New York area and please tell them to go by the way there's someone driving down from ottawa to go to october 7th play.com so if they can drive from ottawa you can fly to new york um so please go and see the play we'll be there every night so come and say hello to us thank you bye <laughs>